Hi, Evan. Uh, hi, Gabriel. If you guys have anything you'd like to report, um, then I'll be happy to go over it with you. Sorry for the delay. Um, and uh, my apologies for messing up the timing. Um, let me just quickly brief you uh, before we start uh, about what's going on for steps. Maybe that will be a good way to uh, just um, start talking about the project work. So let me share that with you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay, great. So um, this uh, flyer is in Slack. Um, so basically, next Wednesday from 3 to 7 o'clock, uh, there will be the STEPS Project Showcase, which is an SOC event, which is not just for our uh, module, but for a number of other modules as well. So um, it's great if um, uh, each project will have a team member who's able to make the time uh, to attend the event. Um, and if not, that's okay, uh, but we, we definitely would like you to reserve time for it. So um, the way it works is that um, it's basically a Zoom-based presentation. So there'll be a main room um, and a project pitching room. Uh, these are the two labeled rooms and then there will be breakout rooms for project demos and discussions. So uh, for example, if you're not able to attend the timing for your uh, CS6101 uh, uh, pitch, then what you can do is uh, create a very short um, video uh, that we can play on your behalf. Okay, so um, how it works is, uh, you saw it also in Zoom, is that there is a, uh, a pitching time uh, which starts at free and goes until uh, 3.50 for all of our projects uh, in our course. So uh, I think most of uh, the ones uh, such as your, uh, your project and, and uh, Gabriel's project, they're in the first half of the course. And for uh, Wei Chong and Xiao Rui, uh, Xiao Rui I think uh, your, yours are in the second half, uh, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so um, basically there will be a, a demo room for uh, each project, and, and um, if you have time over the, the first hour or so, you can go to your uh, uh, demo room and, and um, demo your project for uh, any people coming into it, and I would encourage uh, that you try to visit other people's uh, projects and, and talk with them. It's not very fun in steps if uh, you don't participate and, and talk with other group members who have done their projects, okay? So I think it's set up so that you can record your own room and discussion. Um, so uh, I would recommend that if you want to get a little bit more out of your project work. Okay, so that's basically how it works. Uh, there is also a voting form um, that you can vote for yourself or other people. So it looks a little bit like uh, this one here. Uh, I don't think it's currently voting. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it does work. So uh, there's a, a form here. So if you go to 6101, you'll see a voting form and then you can nominate uh, for first, second or third place. Okay, and then um, you can submit this form and uh, give your voting token here so that uh, they can capture it. So uh, this is for uh, most popular project in the course. Uh, so. I think uh, for our course, we'll probably have just have one prize. So uh, please do uh, vote for your own project or if you find another uh, group mates project uh, pretty good, then please by all means vote for their project. Okay, so um, that is actually all the updates that we have uh, about the 13 steps. So uh, in, in Slack, I hope you'll be able to uh, uh, double check that you've gotten everything done that needs to be there for the project work. Um, specifically, you need your abstract. I see uh, a number of people have put up their abstracts, not everyone. Uh, if you have a graphic uh, that you'd like to include for your project, that's also very good to have. Okay, um, enough from me. Uh, so I, I'd like to actually get more um, input from all of you. Uh, since we don't have that many people because I missed uh, the first hour, I'm wondering whether we would like to take a, a, just a couple minutes. If you have slides, great. If you don't, that's fine. Um, 
to give an update about how your project is going. So uh, I think we'll just start in order of uh, the name list uh, that I have in the participants. It's ordered by, I, I think, first name. So Evan, then Gabriel, then Zihan, uh, then uh, uh, Chao Rui, and then uh, Wei Chong. Uh, maybe you guys can go in order and just let me know how things are going, whether you need any input or anything. So we'll start with Evan. Do you have any input that you'd like to give about your project? Okay. Uh, hi. Wait. Let me just base my slides in. I guess. Uh, projects. Okay. So. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, haven't really been very active in the course recently because of work. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say I'm quite behind all the other groups. But where I've got to is uh, actually, uh, implementing the KG AT paper. So that's the knowledge graph attention network for recommendation paper. And oh. uh, my I implemented it in PyTorch, while the original uh, code base was in TensorFlow. Mm. So uh, my results are slightly uh, lower than uh, what's indicated in the paper, but uh, no more than like five percent. So I think that's not too bad. Yeah, that's but, pretty uh, good for replication work. Yeah, but uh, so now what I'm doing is uh, cause the implementation is quite messy, so I'm working on cleaning that up, but. Aside from that, uh, I'm not really clear, uh, like where else to go. <laughs> yeah. So okay. uh, I have looked at some of the other papers that uh, um, Xiang Nan her has uh come up with, but uh, I I'm not really sure like uh whether I should look at uh trying to implement those or like try and tweak something to this uh, existing model. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what I recommend is uh, you look at the model that you've already created and you look at the items that are being recommended and uh, you try to study some analysis, you know, about uh, the patterns of recommendation, especially if you can train the model with certain parts off, right? So uh, yours is a, a knowledge-based recommender, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So uh, for example, if there are different types of edges or, or, or different, um, uh, means of turning on or off different components of the knowledge graph. You may want to try to study those uh, for particular items. So you may find that some of the items being recommended actually depend very heavily on the knowledge component um, and different aspects of the knowledge component. So having an analysis of that might give you some clues about um, whether the claims in the original paper are validated or um, whether they're not. Okay. Yeah, so I wouldn't go ahead and try to implement an additional model. Um, you know, certainly if you're interested, you could do that. But I think it's more helpful to get a, a better understanding of um, which part of the, the model seeks to help in different places. Yeah, uh, the other thing you could do if you'd like is to, uh, you know, vary the model architecture a little bit if there are certain mathematical operations that are being done, like concatenation, addition, multiplication, etc. Um, you could study the effects of changing those right on, on the recommendation output and see whether it gets uh, different results than reported in the original paper. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I understand you're a two-person group. Are you doing it alone? Uh, yeah, I'm doing it uh, with uh, uh, with Raibu. Yeah, uh -huh. but he's uh, not online at the moment. Yeah. So have you been able to coordinate with him at all? Uh, yes, I have been able to. But uh, cause he's in uh, Canada, so like uh, time zone wise, it's a little hard. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, we've mostly mostly been communicating through uh, messaging on Slack. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So if, if uh, let's say both of you coordinate a, a little bit of analysis or each of you could choose a, a different part of the model to investigate, that would be great um, uh, as output uh, to, to examine whether you can replicate the, the paper or extend it a little bit with some uh, analysis work. But I hope the project uh, implementation wasn't too taxing uh, because you had, you said some code from TensorFlow, but you ported it over to PyTorch. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you one final question. Is the code that is available for this model also available in PyTorch from any other repo? Uh, yes, there's one other uh, person who did implement it, but uh, I tried to implement it a little differently because in the paper, there were like uh, three layers that they explicitly mentioned, but uh, in that guy's uh, implementation, it 
uh, he kind of just uh, combined all of them into one, but I wanted something more modular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it might be good if you uh, uh, publicize your GitHub repo uh, so that um, other people could benefit from your code if, if that's something that you're willing to do. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks for uh, attending. And so uh, the last things are you need to prepare the poster. Um, and uh, uh, if you're able to make the showcase, that's great. Uh, I think uh, your project, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I believe I'm lost in the. Yeah, it's at 3.50, uh, I think, in the afternoon, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so uh, if you can make it, that's good. If not, if you have a, a quick uh, three to five minute uh, uh, recording uh, of you narrating the poster or uh, Rabio uh, narrating the poster, that would be great. Uh, then we can run that for you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can stay on it and, and, and listen to other uh, group projects if you want, uh, but I, I totally understand uh, that uh, you weren't prepared uh, because I, I didn't give anyone any notice about um, the consultation session today. Okay, so if you if you need to go, I understand. Okay, thanks, Evan. Okay, thank you. Okay, Zuhan, uh, you're up next. Or, or uh, Wei Chong, do you want to? Uh, yeah, oh. because we three of us in the same team, so ah, I'll okay. share the screen instead. Okay, great. Okay, hold on a second. All right. Okay, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it will be a continuation of uh, what what things were two weeks ago. So I'll do a quick recap. So previously we uh, identified this uh, data set called Avazu, which is a click through, click through rate data set. So it's, we are trying to predict if uh, uh, given some features, if the user clicks through, you know. So if you look at the, 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 the picture on the right, there's this uh, click, which is zero or one. And the rest are all, uh, variable, I mean, basically information that helps the prediction. Yeah. And of course, uh, because the data set seems to be quite huge, so we use a very small subset instead. So it'll be well, we are using only 1 million data points, which is, uh, yeah, really like it felt, it feels like around 2% of the total data, uh, the data set. Yeah. And yes, we break it down into training, validation, and tests. So for the implementation that we are working with, we established some baselines. So for the figures quoted in the paper, they achieved this uh, 0 0.78 for the area under curve and 0 0.38 for the log loss. And whereas on the other hand, for us, when we do the same thing for the vanilla implementation and we also got a similar set of results. Yeah. In fact, slightly better. So, but of course, we. Our results are based on a subset, whereas their results are on a full data set. Right. You said you have a very small slice of about 2%, right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you so, sample that in any particular way, or did you just take the first 2%? Because, uh, uh, you know, if if their data set is uh, time series sensitive, it may matter how you sampled. So, yes, I only sampled the first 2%. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So that's probably the best way to do it since, uh, um, yeah, but uh, make sure when you uh, are doing your testing that you have um, mm -hmm. right training and testing split in the sense that you only look at uh, training on the, the first part of the 2%. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do some peaking, then you, you may get better results just because you can interpolate between data points rather than extrapolate. Understood. But, um, okay. Mm, I'm not sure if, because I think for, for this data set, the full data set is uh, spread out across 10 days. So for us, if I do 2%, it is most likely within a short period of time anyway. So I do understand your point that maybe if you need to do training on uh, 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 within a fixed time interval and rest test on a smaller time, on a different time interval. Am I right to say that? Yes. Yeah, That's but I think because 2% of 10 days is like, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> Still a short period of time. Yeah, not much. Maybe about so, uh, yeah. half an hour or so. But right, uh, right. It, it, it could be that you have a lot of, um, you know, if, if there are session data, right, then you get actually mm -hmm. 
some some information in your training that has to deal with one person's session over um you know a yeah, couple yeah. data points so it's it right, still right. may be valid you may want to do some you know exploratory data analysis to see whether that type of problem will, will crop up and um changes the, the value of, of might change the value of your um uh you know auc or log loss understood so but okay so in in, a, in my case my split was done in a random manner so i simply yeah. you know just random across the one million yeah i wasn't thinking too hard about it yeah 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 i understand uh right. the things yeah. that may, if you have time you can ask mm -hmm. one of your team members to try uh engineering a proper training and test split okay okay um so that you for any one user you have let's say the first 80% of, of their transactions, if there are, you know, sufficient to call it that, um, you know, okay. and then use the last 20 as test, uh, you know, I see. So that, that might be another way to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, it's quite easy from my pipeline. Yeah, correct. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you can test that and then, uh, you know, add another mm -hmm. column of, uh, of AUC and log loss to that, yeah. which is, you know, when, when I, I, I do it in the proper, uh, training and test and validation split, these are the results I get. And then you can okay. check the paper itself, right? The paper mm -hmm. itself uh, should have had um, a correct uh, training and testing split, but if not, uh, you may be able to detect that from their um, paper itself. Okay, understood. Yeah, that makes sense, yep. Yeah, I suspect this is why our results are slightly better because of how we do the training test split. And also the fact that we are only using a very small subset, yeah. Yeah, so subsampling definitely could get you much better or much much worse results. You can never know. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that it's fine. I mean, it seems like it's replicating okay, uh, given that, mm -hmm. that it's not too far deviant from the performance measure that uh, uh, other people have reported on the full data set. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me move on to the with this the, the variations we did on the algorithm. So recall that two weeks ago I mentioned about how. The authors tried this thing, uh, this uh, layer called bilinear layer, where they attempt to have something more expressive than the vanilla Hadamard product. And for me, in my case, what I thought was that since Hadamard product seems to be quite widely used among uh, within uh, other literature, and it's probably a group prior to uh, learning some uh, features, you know. And since uh, and these authors they propose using uh, one more set of and, uh, vectors to try and make it more expressive and they then they claim better results. So of course, I want to check if the residual way of combining Hadamard and bilinear might improve things. So of course, my results are as shown. I would say that they are pretty much the same, I think, not conclusive. So if I look, look at a log loss, I wouldn't say there's any change. If I look, look at a test uh, area under curve, mm, there seems to be some weak evidence that it is better. But nonetheless, I wouldn't say it's conclusive in any manner. Yeah. Okay, but you have a, a, a million samples. And uh, so the statistical significance even of 0.2% is pretty large, right? It's a couple mm. hundred samples that um, it is. Uh, okay, to, to be exact, my test set is only 20% of 1 million. So there'll be 200K. Yeah, 200K, yeah. but still 200K. And uh, if you think like, say, um 0.1 percent of that 200k is still um mm -hmm. quite sizable right it's mm -hmm. a, a couple hundred examples so um uh there, there may be some signal there uh from a statistical standpoint just because you're working okay. with data you know this type of um very uh uh marginal i wouldn't say marginal uh very small slice uh, improvements you know are, are what amazon and, and other systems that do a lot of a b testing optimize for so when you collapse them all on top of each other they get significant gains so um yeah it, it's yeah. not it's not trivial to say that uh it has a small effect it's still noticeable given the fact that you have a very large data set i mean okay when i look at these numbers i was quite divided because uh, AUC, yes, is better, but log loss seems to be pretty much the same. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would think that is quite inconclusive on my end. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. So you, you need to know what the AUC is doing and the log loss is doing to be able to try to tease yeah, out. Yeah, correct. Um, if, again, if you have time, uh, maybe one of your group members could try to examine uh, 
why is one going up and one going down? Sometimes you can discern this by looking at which items uh, they, they got correct on, on, under which, which metric, okay, uh, in order yeah. to, to figure out why, yeah. So you could look at ones where uh, items got uh, improved to, to make the AUC better, but the log loss has gone down. That might give you a clue um, what, what type of things have uh, happened for that. Yeah, because it's a little bit hard to diagnose otherwise, right? Because you're yeah, using a, a mathematical arithmetic expression to express something and then hard to translate it back um, to, to find a causal reason for why those items got better or worse, right? So sometimes yeah. it's easier to analyze from a set perspective. Like if you take the collection of a hundred items that got better mm -hmm. um, due to one and worse to the other, and you take a look, oh, these items, uh, yeah. For some reason, cluster in this area that they have a you know very few repeated users or something, or or very highly recommended for a niche group of people. Maybe that's a, a good way of figuring out what's going on. Okay, I understand. But anyway, just a slight comment because I think for this particular data set, I think trying to uh, do post mortem, trying to analyze what's going on might be tough because uh, going back to this slide, for uh, almost all of this uh, data, they hmm. are not very interpretable. They are mostly, I think, I look at them as 32-bit UUIDs, you know, unique IDs, and mm. they are just not very readable. I mean, I can't tell what's going on most of the time, really. You are right. Yeah, okay. it so was terrible. That, that, that idea may not yeah. fly very well. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay, so I think, okay, for the remaining slides, I will let my teammates talk about what they did. So, okay. yeah. Okay, hi. Uh, so I uh, also complete another variation uh, because in PPNet it came out with the idea that replaces the factorization machine with the standard structure mm -hmm. and explore a little bit uh, of different combinations between the Hadamard products and the linear products. So just think uh, because they're intrinsically different from, and uh, not intrinsically different, they're uh, different from factorization machine because they have a different weight over uh, the embeddings and such that on the second layer of interaction, um, it's it's going to produce a very different result from the factorization. So uh, my exploration is that uh, if we add a factorization machine inside, then how this algorithm form and uh, will factorization machine take over or will uh, KPNet take over? And so uh, uh, the the second and third line are the result that uh, produced. You can see that actually the uh, the result has become <laughs> worse in the case. So I think uh, probably there are some uh, effect and duplications between the factorization machine and, uh, and uh, the VBNet, the set structure such that it may cause some, some sort of um, uh, overfit in a sense because uh, both of them are doing the same thing and uh, it doesn't, it, it might sabotage the generalization performance that it has set. Yeah. Uh, how are you combining the two? Uh, so uh, like in the TBNet, it has two logics, one from the linear predictor and one from the, the standard structure. Like, and then I add a factorization machine that produces one additional logic. So there are in total three logics and then they add them together. Okay, I see. So you're adding a third component to the loss. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Due to factorization recommendation. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess the first culprit is, of course, uh, thinking about overfitting. Um, I wonder if there's a, another way that you could combine um, to see whether there there are items that uh, in the factorization machine or or in the feeding net uh, do better in one versus the other, and then think about a, a gating mechanism or a switch. That would help you decide, right? Uh, I mean, if you're looking at an addition, uh, you have no way of uh, conditionally combining information from the free models, right? Yeah, it's a direct addition, so there's yeah. no no remaking. Yeah, there's no conditional gating or anything like that. So there may be uh, certain cases that um, um, you can analyze um, where the factorization machine has a very strong idea about what. Um, it wants to recommend or, or what it, it prefers to do, right? Compared to FibiNet and the other way around. 
So that, that can be, you can look at the components uh, before the linear addition, right? And say, okay, when, when the factorization machine uh, has a strong um, opinion or when PhoebeNet has a strong opinion, how, how does the F measure work out there, right? And so um, your, your uh, linear combination may be uh, able to diagnose a bit better on that. So just adding some additional uh, hyperparameter for the weighting Sense. Yeah, I mean, that is the tuning part. Uh, I'm thinking more on the analysis part, right? So if, if you just look at the cases where the coefficients coming from the factorization loss uh, and the Fibonacci loss are uh, different, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I see. I understand your point. Yeah. And then uh, trying to tease out again whether there's a cluster of, of items. Um, that are uh, better due to uh, the factorization machine uh, recommendation versus the Phoebe net one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you want to take it to its logical conclusion is uh, like you say, put a hyperparameter on that or, or some type of decision network on that that allows you to decide when to use uh, which system. So it would be some type of ensembling model. Okay. So your results are, are slightly worse or are they uh, much worse? Uh, slightly worse. And so if you, you can see the, the second, third line are the result from this, this model, the, the variation. Uh -huh. No other baselines. That, uh, the baseline is the original FibiNet work. Yeah, yeah, the original. The replicated work that you guys did over the 2%. Oh yeah, this is the replicated work version uh, over the 2% because we think that this is a bit unfair to compare with the original. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. That that makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah. Without uh, additional analysis, it's hard to diagnose. But yeah, that that sounds like a, a good plan. At least you uh, looked through it and uh, you tried combining it and, and adding another loss, and it didn't seem to help uh, in in the vanilla style that you added so far. So that's fine. So yeah, please pr present this result on your poster, uh, and if you have um, an hour or two over the next week or so, um, then try to diagnose a little bit uh, deeper into why this variation doesn't work or uh, whether there's a way to, to get, uh, to exploit it, to get it to work better. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Do you have any other slides that you want to present? Yeah, there's one more slide. Okay. Yeah, so the last variation we did is to add a gating mechanism between the linear and bilinear logic. As in the original model in the output layer, uh, they directly combine the linear and bilinear uh, logic by addition without any weights, then apply a sigma function on it to get a uh, probability. So we think there might be a need to add a weight on the term to balance the two terms. So we use a uh, like linear, uh, linear network uh, apply on the input features to uh, get a uh, weight for them. Yeah, and for the results, um, I think it's also slightly worse than the baseline. Okay. Yeah, I can see that it's gone down a little bit, not very much. So again, the same recommendation is that when, when things uh, actually run and you get results and you get uh, marginal changes in imp uh, performance improvement, either going down or going up, it's good to try to diagnose uh, through some uh, subset analysis uh, what's going on, right? So it could be that you get more type one errors or type two errors and looking at the confusion matrix may, may give you some clues. So you need to do some a little bit more analysis on what type of items are affected. Yeah. So, um, so did, did you think about uh, what other factors could be causing the gating mechanism not to work? Is there enough data to properly set the gate? I think in the original model, they, they have a weight for the linear features. So I think there might be an overlap of the impact of these two. 
Okay, so since they already have weights on the linear features and they just add them together, that is already serving as the, the, the mechanism for weighting the linear and bilinear, is that right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so the gating mechanism is somewhat redundant. And, and then um, because you have two mechanisms doing the same thing, then it's um, you know probably causing some noise. Is that what you're thinking? Um, yes. Okay. Then the other thing you could do is uh, you, you know you can substitute the gating mechanism for the coefficients in the linear system, right? So if, if that is uh, still working out from a mathematical point of view, where you have the linear um, system but you don't give it uh, a, a weight weighted coefficients, but you use a gate to combine it with the bilinear ones. That, that is a, a different mechanism for achieving similar, um, similar functionality to the original system, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in that sense, then you have two different mechanisms, uh, the original mechanism, which is just coefficients, uh, and the second mechanism, which you introduced, which is a gating mechanism, Right, and uh, you can use either way of, of um, combining um, the two uh, appropriately, right? So it may be that you find it easier or uh, harder, or uh, sorry, not easier or harder, um, uh, better performing or uh, worse performing using one of the variations, okay? Um, in any case, for all of these features that uh, you guys have tried, you might find that it changes, the performance changes when you use different scale data sets. Uh, I know it's, it takes time to con, um, train these algorithms. So I wouldn't recommend trying to scale up to let's say 4%, but if it's easy for you to downsample and, and try with a smaller data set, for example, instead of 2% with 1% or half a percent or uh, a quarter of a percent, then you can actually plot some uh, useful uh, analysis graphs to see whether a, a certain variation algorithm might actually eclipse performance at, at a certain data scale. Okay, that, that's often the case is that a, a deep learning architecture works not because of the model architecture, but because there's a good fit between the number of parameters and the size or quality of the data set, right? So, I mean, we see this all the time that if you take a very big transformer model and try and train it on small data, it terribly overfits, right? And, and similarly, if you have uh, certain mechanisms, like say this gating mechanism versus the coefficients um, that is an original system, maybe one is, is less parameterized than another and it would work well for a certain data scale. Okay, so um, yeah, you can test those if you have time. Um, I, I know it's hard to do that under the constraint that you have, which is due next week. Um, so uh, you, you can decide whether that's worth, worth trying to do, okay? Yeah, and it's also hard to make stable, right? Because these runs are, uh, when you cross validate them over several runs, you get very different performance. So uh, it's already clear from your, your case that you actually did five runs, you did five full CV, so that's good. So those results are, are more, more likely to be stable. You know, on your poster, you could also give some uh, whisker plot or something like that to show the max and min of all, all five of your runs uh, mm -hmm. uh, or a standard deviation, a box plot, so that uh, it's more apparent whether these have any um, statistically significant effects, right? But like I was saying with Wei Chong at the beginning, I think it's very much the case that, uh, you know, since your data set is very large, um, even with, a, 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 you know, a fractional percentage point difference, those, those changes are likely to be uh, actually significant changes. Okay. Yep. All right, any other questions that you guys have since uh, all three of you are in the same project? Not for me. Okay. okay. So great. I'll stop um, sharing my screen. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. Uh, you guys are the only uh, two teams here today and uh, that's my fault. So uh, don't worry about it. So uh, we'll see you uh, next Wednesday. I'll try to ping you guys uh, later, uh, maybe Monday or Tuesday to make sure everything is on track.
Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, team uh, Fibinet. Okay. Take care. Have a good day ahead. Thank you. Bye bye. Slides. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah um, we just um, yeah, just talk a little, um, explore a little about the the paper dialogue we uh, WA history, and right. the actually for now um we are going to the goal of our project is here we're going to uh, explore how the uh, number k of the prior oil components will influence uh, overall performance and what's the um what's the uh, prior oil components capture the actually the, the um, cont contents of the mm -hmm. in response generation so that's the overall idea of our um, um, project. Right. Yeah. So, um, so this part, I think we can skip that. Yeah. And um, for now, this rest our progress and our um, re result here. Uh, maybe, uh, Luo Fan. Yeah. So we use the daily dialogue data set. Right. And uh, in the original paper, they try setting k is equal to three. So we are wondering whether if we choose a different k, then the model's performance might be better. <laughs> and the metric used in the paper uh, are three. The first one is blue. Second one is bow embedding. So basically, this tool measures how your generated response is close to your ground truth response. Right. And also, you have some kind of intradistance, interdistance. So this two measures how diverse your response is. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the goal here is you want to generate uh, different responses. Right. So you it want a more diverse. diverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, like we highlight the maximum value in each metric. You can see that as for blue and bow, maybe k is equal to three is the best one. Then that that may that may be the reason why the paper chooses k equal to three because it can achieve a higher accuracy in response generation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the diversity, then you can say maybe higher k is better. So that is to be expected because the paper they uses a Gaussian mixture model to generate response. So in Gaussian mixture, you have a parameter called uh, the number of components, right? right. So, so the, depending on uh, which component you use, you might generate slightly different response. Mm -hmm. So if you choose a higher K, then definitely you will generate a diverse, more diverse response. Uh, but um, if we set a higher K, then there may be some trade-off because we increase the parameter space we need to estimate because for like for different pi you have different mu and sigma uh, this to estimate yeah but the, there's not too many more parameters right i mean you have a mean and standard deviation for each gaussian mixture yeah and yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah so actually you can see the metric does not differentiate much although Although you can choose the best one here, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so that's good. So you're you're validating, I guess, your hypothesis that adding more clusters increases diversity at the cost of uh, uh, of fidelity, right? Uh, you you get more diverse responses, but they cohere less to your ground truth. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, Pongfu, can I go to the next slide? Yeah, as for the second hypothesis, what we want to verify is we want to interpret K. So this is the result from the original paper. When they said K is equal to three, they select some kind of examples. So this bulk of example is generated by component one. This right. dialogue generated by component two. So their interpretation is that if you look at component two, then you can see they express a strong will when they generate response. But for component two, maybe the dialogue is more like, I'm not sure, or I have no idea. So it's some kind of uncertainty here. Right. Then for component three, then 
there are some negative responses like no i don't of course not mm -hmm. so we plan to do the same thing for k is equal to five and k is equal to ten yeah well, we haven't got the results yet because these two weeks we mainly focusing on training the model yeah but i think uh we because we have the model now so we can finish it this week yeah okay my guess is that these results from table four in the paper are actually quite cherry picked, uh, meaning that they, they looked very hard to find good components. So it'd be interesting whether you can validate that, uh, you know, you could start by trying to replicate their results with K equals three and see whether you, you see the same thing because you're using the same data set, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 My, my guess is it won't be as clear cut as this, you know, uh, but the yeah. whole point is like in the paper, you want to show as clear cut hmm. information as you uh, wish so that you can convince your reviewers your model is doing good. So there's probably going to be some overlap. Um, you know, I, I think it's almost always harder to diagnose larger K because uh, it gets much more varied. Um, but uh, you, you may find that there are some regularities with respect to topics or, or um, you know, sentiment, yeah. I mean, with k equals to three, it's it's pretty um, easy to see that you know, for at least sentiment, you should get something that's a, you know sort of neutral one that's positive and one that's negative. But yeah. I, it's not so clear what you would get from a, a k equals five or a k equals ten, right? Uh, I think that yeah. would be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you may need to do some other type of analysis to to figure it this out rather than just um, uh, analyze them by hand. Right. So, for example, a frequency uh, analysis of, of which vocabulary tends to fall, uh, you know, what, what are the top uh, vocabulary features in each of the K might give you a better handle on, on um, why, why that is a coherent cluster. Oh, so you mean that we can do something like TF idea for each component then to get an idea of what this topic learns? Yeah, a little bit like that. Or yeah. if you have some type of visualization, of the clusters, oh, yeah. you know, you might be able to see that, okay, topic five and, uh, you know, K, K component uh, four and six actually are pretty close together. Um, they're the ones that are most similar. And then uh, by looking at the component uh, generated response, maybe you see similar types of response. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So can I clarify that when you mean you want to visualize the cluster, do we first convert the sentences into embeddings and then we project it onto some low dimensional space and see the customer behavior, something like that. Yeah, that might be easier just because then you can get an entire view of the data set that way. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because if you have to analyze them one by one, um, maybe it's pretty hard, right? Yeah. But if you, let's say, do the conversion to embedding or a sentence embedding or average embedding, and then you throw it into T-SNE or some other dimensionality reduction so you can plot it um, and then colorize the plots by components then you may be able to, to get something that's a little bit more interpretable. Yeah, I think. Uh, okay, okay. Hmm. Go ahead, Hongfu. Uh, yes, that's um, all from over here. Uh, this is another, oh, this is an, un, um, com, it's an incomplete schedule table. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we don't have to finish the writing something. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are you guys uh, feeling that you have an equal share of contribution on your project? Uh, it's hard to tell from your, your incomplete schedule. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, because Liu Yong is doing TM1, but I don't know what that is. So um... this is um, maybe I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Liu Yong's contributions to trying to train the model and write some. Uh, it's great for the model training. Okay, so mostly the model training work. Okay. 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 Uh, that's all about, for, for now, about our progress. Okay, so uh, great. So um, going ahead, uh, I think, uh, you guys should know that uh, from the Slack group that the uh, presentation is next week on Wednesday. Yeah. So um, each group has about five minutes to to uh, go over what they've done. 
Um, but it's perfectly fine if you have a longer version of, of what you want to present, uh, because obviously it's not easy to present everything in five minutes, especially if you have to describe the original model before you talk about the analysis or replication that you did. So um, in, in the breakout rooms, you can do that. Um, if you have uh, populated information in, into steps, that's good. If you haven't done that yet, you definitely need to do that by uh, next Monday so that uh, the, the information about the poster and the abstract are there. Okay. 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 So I think you're almost there. You got replication. You were able to get some results. Uh, you haven't looked at any of the actual results yet. Ha is that right? Um, yeah. Have you actually analyzed or, or looked to see that the output uh, of your replicated uh, work seems you, to, to be similar to what's reported? Uh, you, you mean some case uh, in the, the, the decoded case? Yeah, the actual decoded dialogue. Yeah, we have some, we see some, um, some, case, some example like this, but uh, actually we found that if the context is uh, is simple, for example, just one sentence or two sentences, the response should be fine. But if the contain, context uh, is, um, is uh, two or three or longer uh, sentences, uh, it will be uh, worth the, I mean, the, the generated response has a low correlation to the uh, context. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that may point to some some other method for controlling the amount of um, variability you want in your response. So, for example, if you have different models with different Ks, right? You can say, okay, well, this this response is short. I would trust a, a model with a higher diversity with K equals five to give a good response. So, um, to do that type of analysis, then you can say, okay. When I look at different um, size contexts, uh, I can see that uh, certain models do better at generating useful yet diverse responses, right? Oh, yeah, so right. for example, if you have a context of five sentences, okay, probably I don't want to go to the K equals 10 model because that's going to be pretty pretty far off. I already know it's going to be too diverse, right? So um, I, I, I'm going to constrain it to, to use the K equals three model in this case. So you don't have to build this sort of ensembling or, or, or gated or this a condition model by hand, but you can just analyze, right? Like you, you said, you noted that different contexts lead to different quality. Okay. 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 Yeah, so I think that might be a, okay. a good way to to uh, sum up the analysis that you uh, do. But that is, of course, um, conditional on, on what other type of um, uh, features you find in the responses, right? So there are a couple of different things you can analyze, right? So you can decide which which aspects you want to analyze, whether there's a, a case of um, the diversity of the responses, um, where things go incoherent, uh, whether certain information is correctly copied when it needs to be from the prompts uh, or the context. Those are all different aspects which you can analyze to give a, a, a more holistic understanding about which K module might be better, right? And then you have your intrinsic uh, evaluation of what those K modules are, um, like what was done in the table in the paper. Um, but as I noted, it's probably going to be hard for you to diagnose what's going on in the case of K equals 10 or 5. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Great. Okay. okay. Thanks so okay. much for coming uh, to the short meeting. I apologize again for missing uh, the earlier timing at 1. Okay. No, my thanks, Prof. Thanks. Okay. Prof. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you. Yeah.